Good evening, and welcome to the Cypress Fairbanks ISD's Board of Trustee Candidate Forum. My name is Jason Culpepper, and I have the honor of serving as tonight's moderator. I'm the Houston Metro Publisher for Community Impact Newspapers. I'm also a proud graduate of Jersey Village High School and currently serve as a trustee for the Cypher Educational Foundation. Tonight's forum will be two hours in length and will provide each candidate an opportunity to introduce themselves and field questions submitted from the community. It is our hope that this forum allows each candidate time to voice their positions and reasons for pursuing a place on the school board while giving the public a chance to hear the candidates respond to questions. Tonight's forum is currently being broadcast live over Comcast Channel 16 and the district website at www.cfisd.net. Tonight's process will be conducted as follows. The candidates will be given one minute to introduce themselves and share information they feel the community should know about their candidacy. During the question and answer portion of the forum, each candidate will have one minute to answer each question. At the end of the evening, candidates may provide a closing statement. Again, one minute. Time will be kept by Holly Reichert, Secretary to the Superintendent and the Board of Trustees. You will notice a timer in front of the tables. This timer will be programmed to warn you when you have 15 seconds remaining to, um, in your introduction, response, and, and closing. When the timer buzzes, please wrap up your statement within the next few seconds. I will alternate who answers first from question to question. I want to remind the audience that questions were submitted in advance and consolidated by topic. Questions will be randomly drawn, time permitting, and not all questions will be asked. Before I introduce the candidates, this is a reminder to please silence your cell phones. Also, Feel free to acknowledge your candidate, their responses um, through uh, applause, but please keep it to a minimum. We have a lot to cover tonight and obviously a lot of candidates that we wanna make sure has the time. At this time, I would like to introduce the candidates as they will appear on the ballot. When I call your name, you will have one minute to make your opening remarks. Are there any questions from the candidates? Seeing none, let's get started. Running for position five, Courtney Spradley. On this event so that you can get to know us a little bit better as candidates. Uh, you will observe tonight that I am not a politician. I am clearly not very polished, uh, but I have lots of heart and a lot of passion for education in this community that hopefully will shine through tonight. Uh, as he said, my name is Courtney Spradley. I am a Sci-Fair mom running for position five. I am running against Mr. Ogletree, who has been on the board for 17 years. I want the values that align with the majority of the community in Cyprus to be represented on the board. I also feel that we, the board, need term limits. I chose to run for the school board because I've spent many hours visiting with family and friends about current frustrations that we're facing in public education. When countless parents are choosing to leave public ed for homeschool or private school options, there clearly is a problem. I decided to take a stand in hopes of making a difference. And I'm already up. That went by really fast. <laughs> Next candidate, <laughs> Natalie Blossengame. Good evening. Thank you so much for being here today. Uh, it's great to see a big crowd. Um, I stand before you as a mother in the system of a thriving 10th grader at Langham Creek High School who really enjoys school. I also am a community volunteer. I've spent countless hours in the schools and in church and other places, the swim team in the neighborhood volunteering. And I'm also a 29-year educator, having spent time as a teacher, an assistant principal, principal, uh, assistant superintendent in several districts around the area, um, giving me a background in education that I can bring to this board position. I hope to represent your voice on this board, 
Uh, the voice of parents and the community are critical. Our values have to be represented there. And so I would seek to have us get to a communication improved. I also want to represent choices for families. Um, it's the strongest system around in, in SciFair. However, I do think there are ways that we can be, continue to offer choices to families that will meet the needs of their individual children and the, what they prefer in their family, and finally, values. Thank you. Grace Warner. You should be, you're on. There you go, sorry about that. Good evening, it's a pleasure to be here tonight. Um, I'm Dr. Grace Horner, and I'm running for position five on the board. I am a wife and mommy of six wonderful Cypher ISD students, two of whom have graduated and four still in the system. Uh, two of my children are also special needs, uh, being autistic and nonverbal. I have 26 years of combined experience within a medical pro uh, profession, uh, man business management, as well as uh, healthcare administration. I'm also a U.S. Navy combat veteran, having served on the USS Carl Vinson and answered the call on 9-11, who was first shipped to respond uh, to Afghanistan. I've served for over five years within Cypher ISD, on PTO in Pope Elementary, as well as in uh, Booster Cub for, the, uh, for Bridgeland High School. Um, I'm a Cypher ISD resource psychologist, with a PhD in Christian Counseling, Marriage and Family Therapy Masters, and also a Bachelor in Healthcare Administration. Um, I treat trauma interventions and personality disorders, and I work with many wonderful families within the district. I will continue to be an advocate and a champion for all students, parents, and educators alike, and I hope to, hope to be able to reach that goal. Thank you, Ms. Horner. John Ogletree. Good evening, I'm Dr. John Ogletree, and I've had four children go through this district and now have five grandchildren in the district. I've been honored to serve on this board for five terms, and during my terms, I've helped lead this district through challenging times. The students we received from Katrina, our Harvey flood, the pandemic, and this February's freeze. I've done this all while focusing upon the academic achievement of each student, opportunity for all. And I want to continue working toward this end. I'm Dr. John Ogletree, position five, Cypher ISD. Thank you, Todd LeCompte. Hello, my name is Todd LeCompte. I'm a husband, father of two boys that are in the school district. I got a ninth, I've got a ninth grader that, that attends Bridgeland High School. I've got a sixth grader that attends Smith Middle School. I'm an entrepreneur. I've built six companies, uh, five successfully. Uh, I bring a fresh set of ideas and, uh, and, a, and a fresh perspective to this community or to the, to the, to the board. Um, I have no ties to any school teachers. I have no ties to any administration. Like I said, I'm, I'm, I'm bringing fresh ideas and fresh perspectives to, the, uh, to, this, uh, to this race. I, I believe that the board should be more representative of the community, not just people that are in, in administrators and, and teachers. And uh, I, I, again, my name is Todd LeCompte. I'm running for position five, uh, trustee position five. I'm position five on the ballot. Perfect, thank you. And the last candidate running in position five, Xavier Leal, is not in attendance this evening. The next position, position six, our first candidate up is Ryan Irving, Jr. Good evening, Cy Fair. Uh, my name is Ryan C. Irving, Jr., and I'm a current candidate for Cypress Fairbanks Board of Trustees position six for this upcoming November 2nd election. I, I am a product of this district. I was raised by not only my, by my single mother, but also by my former teachers and staff who helped not only nurture my mind, but also shape my character. I was a, uh, during my sophomore and, and uh, senior year of high school, I almost faced homelessness. And um, during my senior year of high school, I almost did not graduate. 
Um, I had to attend Lone Star Sci Fair uh, during uh, my first years of undergrad of my college. Uh, and now I am an honor and senior student at the University of Houston. Um, I have interned for Mayor Sylvester Turner in 2017. Um, in 2019, I'm a former school board candidate for the Cypher Board of Trustees position three. Um, in 2020, um, I became a member of the CLC or the Cypher Leadership Committee, whose sole purpose is to lobby on behalf of public education. Um, I am willing and ready to serve not only for our district and for you, but also most importantly for our children. Thank you. Thank you. Just a quick note on the audio, if you can give yourself some space, that should help um, with uh, the feedback that we're getting. Our next candidate, Don Ryan. Good evening. My name is Don Ryan, and I'm running for re-election in position six on the Cypher ISD board. I grew up in this community and graduated from Cypher High School, and all three of our children are Cypher graduates. I'm passionate about our district and our community, and I can tell you exactly why I'm running again and that's because I believe in opportunity for all. Regardless of your zip code, I believe every student should have access to the same programs and opportunities that allow them to pursue their passion. I have a proven track record of focusing on the main thing, and that is student achievement. Experience and leadership has never been more important than it has these past two years while our district navigated through a pandemic. I feel like I'm the best candidate in position six to face the challenges on the horizon, and I hope after tonight I can earn your vote and support. Thank you. Thank you. Chris Harrison. Good evening, everyone. My name is Chris Harrison. Yeah, scoot back a little bit. Here you go. Good evening, everyone. I'm Chris Harrison. I'm running for Software ISD, position six, uh, number three. I'm a father of two students in the Cypher district, uh, one in Anthony and one two-year-old. He's going to be entering in the district soon. I'm coming here to represent the students, the faculty, the parents. Uh, I've been here for three years and uh, has some concerns about where this district is moving forward. Um, great foundation, but I'm here for the people. It's not about me. It's about the people of the community. Thank you. Thank you. Scott Henry. Good evening. My name is Scott Henry. I am running for this position for various reasons. Uh, I am a father of three wonderful kids. One of them is 14 years old, and she's in middle school right now. And she's the reason I'm running. I, I really believe that we should not focus on politics, but we should rather really focus on academics, and that's one of the reasons I'm running, first and foremost. I believe we should have servant lead attitude when we look at our, our, our students, and we should really put that as the first and foremost thing. We need to bring accountability back to, our, back to our board, where we have transparency and accountability back to our board. We should also empower our teachers to be able to teach again. Our teachers really have felt a, a very a vacant spot within that atmosphere. Also, too, we should, bring, we should also look at bringing them back, respecting our family boundaries. I think our parents have felt like left out in the cold, especially if you look at our last board meeting, you can look at all the different aspects of what happened there. I'm running out of time, but I've been in the business industry for 29 years, and I hope to gain your support. Thank you. Thank you. Our candidates for position seven, our first two were not able to attend this evening, but those are Michael V. Perez and Craig A. Jacobs. So our next is Bob Covey. Thank you. My name is Bob Covey. I'm married to my wonderful wife of 48 years, who is a retired teacher. We moved into Cypher in 1975, raised our three sons who have graduated from Texas State, married and have three wonderful wives. I have seven grand gifts, five of which attend Cypher schools. These are my investments in Cypher today. My sons were prior, these are today. My Bachelor of Science is in, ma in math, my Bachelor of Science in Music Education. I taught for three years, then I joined my father-in-law in American Alloy Steel, where I served as Vice President for 40 years. I've been on the school board since 2005 and serve on the Gulf Coast Area Association of School Boards, and I was founding and president of the Go Public Gulf Coast, promoting public education. With me, this is what you get. Focused on student success, and achievement, no matter the zip code or any other definition. I will always be supportive of teachers, administrators, and support staff. Thank you. Lucas Scanlon. Thank you very much. 
My name is Lucas Scanlon. I am here today because I have a first grader in Brunel Elementary in Cypher ISD. I have been married to my wife, my beautiful wife, for 20 years, and we've been in the area since 2009. I want to see change in our school district, and I want to see a good future for my daughter. I am here today to focus on restoring excellence in academics, athletics, and the arts, and getting politics out of our schools. I want to empower our teachers. I've been a teacher. I want to empower them, focus on classroom culture, and enable them to connect with our kids so they can reach the ones that need help. I want to restore trust of our community back into our school board and enable a communication loop that is successful and vibrant. I have attended many universities in my education. I started as a music educator where I taught band at Maid Creek ISD. Uh, I went to University of Houston there. Then I went to Rice University twice, two masters, and then I ended at Harvard. My time in education has taught me a core lesson in that it takes the ability for a teacher to be able to connect with the students to inspire excellence in them. Thank you. Thank you. At this time, we will begin the question and answer section of the program. We will start with position five back at the beginning. Candidates, if I need to restate the question at any point, please ask me. What autonomy, so this question starts with you, Courtney. What autonomy do you feel teachers should have in the classroom? Do you trust that teachers are teaching the curriculum as mandated by the state? All right. Uh, so, as a former teacher, I taught public education at a Title I school and a Title I campus for 15 years. I feel teachers do have quite a bit of autonomy. I know from my own experience, um, you know, you're given the TEKS set forth by the state and you have uh, specific criteria that you need to address um, to make sure your kids are mastering the, the concepts. Um, so I would say that most teachers do have quite a bit of autonomy and they do have quite a bit of um, area to make sure that they're putting in their own uh, teaching style, putting in their own kinds of examples in their lessons. Um, so yes, I do feel that teachers have pretty good autonomy. Mrs. Blossingame? Uh, one, teaching is the noblest of professions and they are the front lines, the most important employees in our entire district. And autonomy is, is one goal, but bringing the joy back to our profession is the greater goal. I think that teach, we need, the work needs to be done to take our curriculum, scrub it down, make sure it represents the values of our community, and give the curriculum balance to the teachers to say, here are the materials you can use. Then from there, allow the teachers some creativity. Teachers struggle to keep the pace uh, of the students that are sitting before them versus the pace of a test at the end of the year. Our teachers should have more autonomy to be able to adjust to the needs of the students sitting before them in the classroom um, to make sure they, they know which, what curriculum needs to be taught by when, but allow them some flexibility to make sure it's actually about the individuals in front of them and not about a state test um, or a benchmark that's coming up. So I would say that teachers within those bounds, we should give teachers autonomy so that they can enjoy their profession and meet the needs of their students. Ms. Horner. So I can speak from a different perspective, and I'm going to try to stay away from this. I'm going to, I can speak from a different perspective as a psychologist and as uh, somebody who has seen a lot of this from the parents' perspective. Um, I believe that teachers do have a lot of autonomy when it comes to you know the, the policies and implementations within their classrooms. Um, some of that can obviously be hindered by a lot of the different uh, policies and different things that have been taking place, especially with the pandemic and all the different um, issues that have taken place since then. Uh, however, I do believe that there should be more of a collaborative effort between parents and teachers. Um, it feels that nowadays a lot of the teachers that I have spoken to are kind of, you know, coming forward with a lot of different is issues, um, kind of concerns that they have, and that's where I come in with advocacy for that. Uh, the, ad the autonomy that exists within the teaching needs to be focused within the individuals and not focused as an one ideal kind of, pers kind of uh, perspective. And teachers should be able to, to implement certain things, but not take it overboard and allow parents to actually make those choices as well. Mr. Goldtree. Yes, thank you. Teachers are professionals. They've been trained, and they should be given uh, autonomy to bring forth uh, the lessons and instructions for 
uh, our students in the classroom. They should be given the autonomy to create, to challenge, to contrast, and to collaborate, all with the goal that the students will learn and they will become the best student that they can be. Mr. LeCompte. I believe teachers should have more autonomy to um, actually just be themselves, bring, bring their own personality to the classroom, uh, give them the materials and let, let them go, do their, do their thing. Um, the reason why I say that is because each student learns differently. You have some kids that are audio, audio kids that are, are listeners, you have some that are visual. You have to give the teachers the opportunity to do their job and do their job effectively. Um, I've spoken with uh, several, several teachers that have voiced their frustration where they kind of feel like robots at times. Um, I, I think that if you, if, you, if you remember the teachers that we had in the, pa in the past when we went to school, it was the teachers that had the ability to make the subjects fun, even when they weren't so fun, <laughs> you know. But uh, I, I, I believe that, uh, you know, given, given teachers an, an opportunity to, to put, their, put their own personality into the lesson plan will benefit all the kids. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Irving. I believe that any teacher should have the full autonomy, but I want to be specifically, uh, specifically clear. Um, within the Texas Education Code, um, our educators are some of the best, if not the best, across the state. But also at the same time, I think it's important that our educators make sure that they um, have full autonomy, but also within the Texas Education Code. Me being a former student, I have witnessed my teachers stay after school till 7, 8 o'clock. I have witnessed our teachers stay after school and mentor and tutor our children. I have witnessed our teachers create creative and fun ta uh, fantastic lesson plans to be able to not only engage students, but also to include students no matter what type of learner you are. Um, so, thank you. Mr. Ryan. Hey, Jason, what was the second part of the question? It was, uh, just reread it. Sure. Uh, let me read the full question. What autonomy do you feel teachers should have in the classroom? Do you trust that teachers are teaching the curriculum as mandated by the state? Thank you very much. Uh, during my time on the board, I've had multiple campus visits all across the district, and. Uh, and I can see the efforts and the work that our, that our teachers put in. I think if you were walking in tonight, you probably saw a group of teachers leaving training and it was 6.30 at night. Uh, but when you look around our district and even the teachers that my kids had, uh, I do believe they have full autonomy in the classroom. I think they do a wonderful job. And as far as staying on the curriculum, that's probably what they do best of all. Uh, you know, we have our state mandated curriculum and they follow that and they're making a positive impact on our students and we see it every day. Uh, you look at our college academy that we started and that's a whole set of students that are, they're getting college teaching as well as high school teaching and those teachers have the flexibility to do that. And that, I'm really pleased with that program, what we're doing there. Thank you. Mr. Harrison. So the question, autonomy and teachers. So first you have to look at it from a business perspective, and that's what we're gonna start with. When you hire talent, and we're talking about the teachers, you don't hire to micromanage. You hire the best talent that the district looks for. So when you assess and you hire great talent, you don't micromanage. You allow them to have the autonomy, again, like one of my constituents said, to bring out and flesh those ideas. But we wanna be within the guidelines and the key performance indicators that the district provides for us. So again, when you hire great talent, you allow them to flourish and you allow them to bring great ideas to the table to increase the uh, student achievement. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Henry. I think you have to look at this holistically. You asked the question very broadly and I think overall, you can't say that very broadly overall. We have elementary, we have high school, we have middle school. And I think you have to look at it individually because they all teach very differently. So if you ask that question of high schools, teachers, it's going to be a very different answer from elementary teachers, especially with COVID where we had to do all the, everything's virtually. It brought out a lot of different questions because especially when I saw the teachers having to react very differently, especially when they had to, you know, do science experiments a very different way, I had to videotape for five different lessons all day long. It's very challenging and I admire teachers for what they do. Now go back to your question, do they have autonomy? I think yes, they have the autonomy. 
my biggest problem with the curriculum we have right now, and I see that from all three of my kids in Sci-Fair, is we have a lot of issues with how the curriculum is being created, and that's one of the things I would like to fix within Sci-Fair when I become a trustee, is the right hand doesn't know what the left hand's doing. When the quiz is created over here, the test is created over here, they don't match. And that's what we gotta fix very quickly. And I hear that from teachers all day long within Sci-Fair. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Covey. Mr. Covey? Would you repeat it just one more time? Of course. What autonomy do you feel teachers should have in the classroom, and do you trust that teachers are teaching the curriculum as mandated by the state? Well, in my many visits, just like Mr. Ryan had expressed uh, across these, all of the schools that we've had, what I see is the autonomy in the classroom. I see the teacher is in charge, but they're not acting as the teacher that I had when I was growing up. They're more, more focused on being a facilitator and working with the kids to achieve what they're asking them to do. I truly believe that we see a lot of great creativity in the classrooms. Uh, and just the fact that you've got a curriculum that is there set for you, you can take that and you can elaborate on it however you want. That's where I see the creativity and that's where I see the amazing things that our teachers are doing for our students. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Scanlon. Thank you. In my time in teaching at Maid Creek in the last year and a half when I taught FinTech at Rice University and then in the last six months at Northwestern University, and in the survey of all the parents and teachers that I've met with uh, during this process, I know from experience that it comes down in the classroom to the ability of a teacher to connect with the children in order to inspire them. It's not about delivering a rote curriculum, and none of our teachers, I believe, are doing that. So to your question, should we empower them to be able to deliver the curriculum, the answer is yes. Do I trust that they're doing it? Well, part of the trust component requires that there's a, there's a partnership with the parents. And I have my own teacher, my, my daughter's teacher, she's done wonderfully well. She's doing a great job collaborating with my wife and I. And when we have a question, she's there to answer it. And so I believe the delivery of the curriculum through our teachers, they need to have the space and the culture in the classroom to be able to do it. They should be empowered to deliver that and they should have a good partnership with the home to enable that all around. Thank you. Our next question will begin with position six, uh, Mr. Ryan. What does educational equity mean to you? And what responsibility does the board have to ensure educational equity for all students? Well, me being no, a recent- Excuse me, Mr. We'll start with Don. Since you went first, we'll go in order all the way back. Yeah, no problem. Mr. Ryan? That's a great question, and I think if you, if you look at our district motto, uh, it answers it pretty clearly, and that is, I believe in opportunity for all. I believe that if, if your child's attending Cypress Lakes or Sci Fair or Bridgeland, like, like Todd's children, that every child will have the same opportunity on that campus as the other children on the other campus have. And I think it's fair, and I think that our district really thrives because we offer that. And I touched on a little bit earlier about uh, our college academy because I'm, I'm very fond of the program, but we started that out at Cypress Lakes and it blew up to where it was amazing. We had 85 students this year graduate with their associate's degree and their high school diploma. And now it's on every campus in our district. And to me, that is equity. When you look at our career and technology programs, district-wide, they're available to everyone and we're having a positive impact on 116,000 students every day. Mr. Harrison. So the first question about equity. My stance on that is every student in the district will be equipped with the tools and the skills necessary to, to come out of the district with To, be com to compete. Uh, going back to the district's mission, uh, competing globally. Uh, part of what you know, the district's is gonna thrive and continue to do is, is we are able to compete. So regardless of if it's you know, a Jersey Village or a Cypress Ranch, they are able to compete and that's across the board. Thank you. Mr. Henry. 
To me, it's about giving the opportunity for every single kid in our district with the ability to perform their barest ability. That's what the American dream is all about. You know, when I was in school, we had kids of all, all races, all creeds, all kinds. And there was a big experiment going on where we, 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 we would we put kids in different groups based upon their ability. And the big experiment was, well, let's go put them over here just because they're not as smart. And that didn't work out so well. If you, if you give kids the ability and say, you perform to this level, and guess what? You put the, put the kids that aren't doing so well in that level, they will perform the level you expect them to perform for. That's what we have to do is we have to put every kid we can and say, you can do whatever you want to because guess what? You can achieve whatever you want to in life. We give the American dream. We can let them perform what they want to. And not every kid's going to go to college either. There's great jobs in electricity. There's great jobs in plumbing. There's great jobs in everything in this world we can give them. And that's what we should give to every kid in, this, in, this, in our, in our side fair. Graduation is a great thing, but there's a lot of things in this world they can give them to. The American dream is out there. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Irving. Opportunity for all means to me um, that every student can be themselves no matter your race, religion, ethnic background, or economic status. Uh, me being a recent former student, I have not only witnessed this, but I was raised that way within our classrooms. Uh, when it comes to our school board, I think the school board's position on this is to make sure that every single child has the same equal opportunity at an education. Um, I was fortunate enough um, during my hard economic times uh, to be treated equal, to be able to receive the same equal opp uh, opportunity at the education as my counterparts and my former classmates. And that's why I'm sitting up here today, because of the job that our school district did in making sure and ensuring that every single student has the same opportunity, no matter where you may come from in our community. Thank you. Mr. Scanlon, same question. Thank you. Today, I'm the Director for Business Transformation and Strategy for my consulting firm. I hire people based upon the value that they bring to the opportunity. I am responsible for defining an opportunity within my client and showing them how to create greater equity of their investments. So when I look at the term equity, that means you have ownership and you've created value. For our kids, they need to be able to take responsibility of an opportunity that challenges them. We're not going to slot them into a position that dumbs them down in any scenario, but rather inspires them to excellence and fosters the grit and fosters the, uh, the overcoming spirit required when you're presented with an actual challenge. So when we look at our kids, my goal, and over my years of education, the number one area that I made change was when I connected with a kid, I gave them a problem that was a little bit bigger than where they were, and I drew them forward. Our teachers need to be empowered to do the same. Thank you. Mr. Kobe. Equity basically starts in the home because in raising three sons, and I'm quite sure everyone has raised multiple children, each child requires something different. And that's what equity means for me, is that we're offering them the opportunity to improve their best person, their best success. They are the ones that are going to go out and it may not be college, it may be career and technology. Our career and technology departments are busting at the seams. We have got something like 130 different certi certific certi I can't even say it. Certifi certifications. You Thank you. Uh, I just, I've, I truly feel like it's once again, it is a combination of the teacher and the parent working together and finding the best that they can do to give those kids the foundation that they need. I believe in that and I will always support that as what equity means to me. Thank you. <laughs> Ms. Blossingame. The goal is not equity. Equity has become synonymous with this idea of bringing the top down and the bottom up to some middle line. The goal is equality of opportunity for every student to achieve their full potential. Every student in our district should have access to an individually rigorous and personally relevant curriculum. They should, every one of them, grow from the place they started to the place they end in a year through choices that meet their needs. Our goal is to prepare them for a two-year, a four-year, a technical certificate, or the military so that they can come out of our schools 
and be good citizens, keep a safe community, get a good job and have a family of their own and continue to the cycle in our community. So our goal should be that equality of opportunity. Many of us know how to fight for our students to make sure they have that. Some families don't have that same uh, ability or understanding. We're here to fight for all kids to have equality of opportunity so each reaches their full potential. Mrs. Horner. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, Ms. Horner. Yes, <laughs> um, so basically, when we look at you know equity, equity kind of comes along the lines of every child ends up the same way, no matter what the struggles, no matter what, and the outcome is going to be similar or the same. Opportunity for all equals equality. You know, children like my daughter, my son, who are disabled and don't have that opportunity all the time. You know, they should be given that equality. Every child must be treated the same. Children are unique. Every single child in Cypher RSD and you know, throughout the nation and the world, really, we all have unique cha challenges, unique skills and talents and everything, and they must be cultivated within the process, especially within education. You know, it's something that assured equality for somebody like me who came into this country not even speaking English, I was just a little one, but I grew up with that kind of, of choice. I was given the opportunity to make those changes in my life and ultimately become successful. And that's exactly what we need to do with children, give all children the same success story. Thank you. Mr. Ogletree. Thank you. Educational equity is what our district uh, is on. Our, uh, the way to, to doing, and I'm glad that our board supports that. It is understanding that every child is not the same. It is meeting the educational needs of every student, regardless of race, ethnicity, gender, language, religion, uh, sexual orientation, uh, family background, or family income. It is not just giving everybody an equal opportunity, it is making sure that once the opportunity is given, that we meet the needs of every student. And with that, that's how we give opportunity for all. Mr. LeCompte. I'm a product of public schools. I graduated from Aldine High School. I, I wish uh, we would have had something like this, <laughs> this discussion when I was growing up. Uh, Educational equity, opportunity for all. There was, there was, there was programs, and there were teachers, and that we didn't have access to when I was growing up. Uh, Aldine High School didn't have the same type of uh, faculty that Kingwood High School had, and I've been on, I've been on that side of the fence, and I understand the struggles that uh, that that kids are, are going through. I think that giving everybody an opportunity in Sci Fair, whether they're whether they, these kids are growing up and they have their own bedrooms in their, in, at their houses, or if they're uh, sleeping on the floor and covering themselves up with newspaper, which we have that as well. I think being able to give, in, give the kids an opportunity to, to be successful and to gain the, gain the knowledge that everyone else has, I think that's, uh, that's I, I, again, I, 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 I support everything about obviously educational equity in this in this school district thank you miss Bradley I misunderstood the previous question so I apologize for that uh, as far as equity and uh, equality they're not the same thing Equ equity means you have the same outcome and not every child that goes through sci fair is going to wind up in the same place in life so, but they do have opportunity for all. They do have all equal opportunity. It's just like my two boys. I have two boys. They're not both going to probably wind up at the same school or have the same outcome and the same career. One might go to trade school, one might go to college. Our role as a public school district is to give them all the same opportunity and whatever they decide to do, we have to prepare them to do that to be a productive uh, citizen, whether that's military, whether that's entering the workforce, whether that's going to college, whatever that is, they're all provided the same equal opportunity, which goes along with our motto, opportunity for all. But they're not all going to have equity. So. Thank you. I just, point of order, please be respectful for the comments that uh, our candidates are prepared to uh, answer tonight, so I appreciate that. Our next question, will, uh, we will shift to position seven. We'll begin with Mr. Covey. 
What are some of the current challenges facing public education and school boards? Well, I, it's always going to be financial, and it's always going to have to do with that, even though SciFair has done quite well. But I think one of the most sad things that we see is the recruitment of new teachers into the, into the education system. And I go to Texas State where they, they do have a large college education program, and I speak to them. And, you know, I find that students there are not even aware of what school boards do, nor are they too much aware of what goes on in a school system. So I try to encourage them to check it out. I, right now, I, I truly am concerned about the retention that we have because I hear about the, the concern from teachers, and I know it's been a difficult two years. So that's probably the most uh, that I'm most concerned about. But I'm also very concerned about misinformation and outright stories that just aren't true without checking the facts. And if you don't check the facts, then how can you possibly know? Thank you. Mr. Scanlon. Echoing one point that Mr. Covey made regarding financial. Uh, yes, we've got a significant challenge in front of us because our teachers are bright people. They've got the opportunity to go into industry and in most cases will make more money than they make as a teacher. So the people that we will retain are people that truly want to teach, people that truly find that as a calling. It is their mission. That means we need to focus on finding those people and connecting with those teachers. And as we connect with those new teachers, because I came through the department at University of Houston, I was one of those student teachers, and I went on purpose to very specific schools to understand what the job was like and understand a day in the life of a teacher. We have to do a good job of recruiting new talent and focus on teachers that want to be there because they want to connect with kids. From the point of retention, we've got to enable teachers to have a good classroom culture so that they enjoy their job and they want to stay. Thank you. <laughs> Move to position five. We'll begin with Ms. Horner. Repeat the question again, please. Absolutely. What are some of the current challenges facing public education and school boards? Okay, so one of the, you know, we've been dealt a very unprecedented hand when it came down to this uh, pandemic. And, you know, obviously there's been a lot of different issues that come about that, uh, whether we look at the financial aspect or whether we look at the, at the differences in, in the inabilities for some of these children to actually become, you know, uh, catch up to where they should be. One of the biggest challenges within that is to be able to have a retention, you know, with the retention within the, within the teachers and having that merit-based staffing that needs to take place within within the whole prospect. I mean, everybody pretty much suffered from all this, from you know staff, uh, students, and parents alike. Uh, this is something that, that needs to be dealt with. Um, it needs to be tackled uh, from a very, very core academic kind of perspective. But we also look at the current climate of the nation and the politics that is constantly seeping into the, s the schools. Our schools have no room whatsoever for politics. Uh, you know, this is the kind of stuff that should not be in the system at all. And this is something that we need to really reinstate educationally for our children and put them first, not cause division. Thank you. Mr. Ogletree. Yes, thank you. There are a number of challenges that we face uh, presently. Uh, first is the financial recovery uh, from the pandemic. Uh, the next is the learning gap uh, that we face with our students who had to go on virtual and, and also uh, not being in the classroom. Then there's the false narrative of critical race theory, which is a misinformation, disinformation. And then there's this onslaught of partisan politics. Our students, our 117,000 students uh, should not be looked at as Democrats or Republican or conservative or moderate or liberal. They're students. And that's what this board and that's what this district must fight, this partisan onslaught. Thank you. Mr. LeCompte. 
challenges that we're facing, uh, that public education faces, I think it starts at home. Uh, we don't have enough two-parent households in this community. Uh, I think that men in general need to step up um, and, and be that male role model that the kids need, whether, they be a, whether you have a daughter or a son. Um, I don't know what I would have done without having that. I, I don't believe in white privilege. I believe in privilege. I believe that if we have people that are that have two parents, that's a privilege. If we live in this country, that's a privilege, okay? Um, the thing that, I, I really, that really bothers me on the, from the board side is the political bias that's basically been put in. And you can actually witness that from, by, by, by listening to that last night. There was a comment that was made by our superintendent about uh, vaccines for kids that were young, younger age group, 5'11". And your job is not to worry about my kid's vaccination status. Your job is to focus on the education of my kids. Ms. Bradley. Is it? OK. Um, so going along with what's already been said, unfortunately, um, always financial. Um, that goes along into recruiting teachers and uh, uh, retaining them. And I think that goes along with um, supporting our teachers and letting them know that they can voice their concerns, they can um, talk to administrators or what have you uh, without fear of uh, their job or retaliation. I think that uh, causes a lot of frustration for current educators. Uh, if you have never been a teacher, you have no idea what it's like to teach uh, in this day and age. Uh, if you have not been in the classroom in the last, I would say, 10 years, it's totally different from probably when you went to school. Um, teachers wear several hats and they need to feel supported and that goes along with discipline as well. That is a huge issue in our schools right now and if the kids are not being held accountable and the teachers are not being supported, that's why you're losing teachers. Ms. Blassingame. I watched or attended the board meeting, uh, not sure, hour and a half, two. The foundational issue is not the budget. The foundational issue is the learning of our students. We are a school district. We're here to make sure our children are learning reading, writing, math, and have a STEM preparation. I watched a lot of political theater last night, but I heard one question raised that probably wasn't anticipated about, hey, do we know how our kids came back from learning loss, which is the first issue we should be discussing up here, learning loss. <laughs> Next, our profession of teaching is under attack. We are the first time in the state less than half of kids want to be teachers or less than half of parents want their kids to be teachers. We have to do what it takes to make the profession look attractive. We do need to pay, which is budget, but there are other ways that that can be achieved. We do need to protect our teaching profession and our teachers so that they will be here for our students. And finally, values are under attack in our schools. Uh, freedom is under attack in our schools, and that is a critical issue. Thank you. Mr. Harrison. Yes. Um, so a couple things um, that need to be addressed. As a father, um, we haven't, we've seen a lot of, again, parenting in the classroom, and we need to allow parents to be the parents. I have two boys outside sitting right here today, and I'm not asking teachers to come home and put them to bed. I'm asking them to prepare them academically, maths and sciences. And that's what I'm here for. That's the reason why I'm running. A lot of distraction about CRT, all this other stuff. I'm really not concerned about all that. The reason why I sit up here is because I want my son to compete by the mission globally, not just on a local level. Uh, I saw an article just recently um, dealing and talking about top 15 middle schools. And I didn't see Cy Fair in there. I moved here three years ago. I want to see us on that list. Thank you. Mr. Henry. I was just scribbling down a bunch of things I thought was challenges, and I, I probably ran out of room here. But I think keeping and attracting teachers is probably the top thing we have to look at there. The teacher sentiment and morale is pretty low right now. I think coming out of COVID, there's a lot of morale issues we have with our teachers. Uh, they feel kind of sacked by that issue. And I think we have to get them back to where they need to be. Yeah, we gave them a pay raise, but their benefits went up. That's, that's, they feel kind of down behind that. Our budget's in the red. We've been in the red for many, many years. We've got to fix that. We've got to figure out what's wrong with that. 
Um, the growing size of Cy Fair, we're getting bigger. The sprawl of Cy Fair, what are we gonna do about that? And also the, the change of dynamic of Cy Fair is changing as well. Uh, do we maybe split up Cy Fair? That's a possibility I've been asked about as well. Do we look at that? I don't know, that's different issues. Uh, then also too, which we haven't really talked about, which is what about the kids that don't go to college and don't go to work, but maybe are on the street? What about those kids? Do we even think about those kids? What are the kids that don't do anything in life? Or even think about those kids? What are we doing with those kids? Thank you. Mr. Irving. Oh, let me answer the question. Um, the first issue is funding. We have a state that has continuously defunded public education. Not only that, but that has withhold all of our one, two, and three ESSER fundings. Another, in, uh, another challenge is school safety. Nowadays, we have intruders that come into our buildings that want to do harm to our teachers and educators, but not, not, only, not only safety in terms of, of actual harm, but in terms of making sure that every child can be themselves. And I think that's important as well. Um, another one is the educator drought. We have educators that are leaving the education industry because they're not being treated correctly, they're not being included. There's actually a house, there's actually a Senate bill that just got passed that's called SB 1444. And what that allows us to do is allow us to get all of this terrible, terrible education system called TRS Care and to find another better health insurance option for our educators so that we can continue to not only retain our good educators, but also recruit good ones as well. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Ryan. Thank you. Uh, funding has, as long as I've been on the board, has always been an issue. What it hasn't been in Cypher ISD is an excuse. We do more with less than any district in the state, and we will continue to do that because we're extremely efficient uh, in what we do on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, issues facing boards right now are going to be more along the lines of transparency, sharing with the public what you're doing, uh, you know, having, just getting the word out more as to what we're doing. The biggest issue facing the district as a whole is definitely going to be learning loss from virtual learning. Uh, that's why we've had free summer school the last two summers. We have algebra camps. Uh, our, our teachers and our employees are going above and beyond to help kids catch up. And then lastly is going to be, well, definitely not lastly, but recruiting and retaining our employees. Uh, we, we need people right now. So if you're out here and you need a job, go to the district. We're hiring. <laughs> Thank you. All right, our next question we will begin at position five with Mr. Ogletree. What is your role as a school board member to ensure the safety and well-being of all students and staff in Cypher ISD? Thank you. That is one of the main roles of a board member. Uh, without safety, education cannot take place. That's why I have voted for our bonds, which uh, will give us increased and enhanced security. I was on the board when we uh, decided to have our own police force so that they could be relational on, on our campuses and uh, present. That's why I have also supported of the initiatives for safety that would stop bullying. Uh, that's why we are, are trying to make sure that our students respect each other and appreciate the dignity and worth of each other and work cohesively with others. And that all adds to the safety on our campuses. Thank you. Mr. LeCompte. I, I believe that as far as, as a school board, mem uh, school board member um, uh, concerning the safety of our students, it, no kid should, should be bullied or, or be afraid to go to school. All right? Speaking from personal experience, I have had a, had a child that was in elementary school last year, and he got to a point where it wasn't fun for him anymore. Um, for, for various reasons. I think we need to understand that our, these kids are half our size as, as adults. And 
even though we're, we're teaching kids not to bully other kids, I think the teachers sometimes need to remind themselves at how large of a figure they are compared to some of the elementary school kids that we have. And just a simple correction at times can, can be, um, I think, detrimental from, from a mental standpoint to some of our children. Thank you. Ms. Spradley. All right, so how uh, safety and well-being. So first of all, we have an amazing police department. So thank you back there, officer. Um, I actually went and visited the uh, police department a couple weeks ago, and they showed me all of their awards. They're one of the top uh, school police departments in Texas, so maybe even the country. Uh, so I think we're doing a great job with that. I think it's very important to have our own police department and not contract those services out. Um, I think it's also great that at the board meeting last night they did discuss uh, internally uh, having their own program uh, to replace No Place for Hate so that we as a school district will be in charge of what that looks like, what those lessons are, and we have the control over that program instead of one that's put out by the ADL. Uh, also, I know that uh, schools now have the VSOF program, which is great for visitors. And every elementary, ki every, every elementary uh, campus that I know of has the, you have to be buzzed in. So I think we're doing a great job uh, as far as safety. Ms. Blossengame. There are two uh, aspects to this that you asked about safety and well-being. For safety, uh, after the Santa Fe shooting, there was a committee formed, a school safety and security committee. It authors a multi-hazard emergency operations plan. I led that work in the last district I worked in. It is very detailed and it lays out, and, and CyFair did a good job very early labeling doors and setting up the infrastructure for safety. And that is an uh, audited process, so I will engage with that audit and that information to make sure that we are on top of all the aspects the other is the well-being aspect, and I think that um, bullying is prevalent and uh, a concern I'm hearing on the campaign trail often. Many parents hurt who tell me about that fact that there's, and so I think that we need to address our discipline procedures and processes. We need to look at the student code of conduct. We need to look at our counseling offices, which are really schedule makers versus counseling offices. We need to get community input into the values that we want to be propagated through those offices, and then we need to make sure kids feel emotionally safe at school and physically safe at school. Yes. Yes. Ms. Horner. So improve school safety. Um, of course, we need to give a lot of accolades to our, uh, to our officers, our ISD police, um, absolutely essential. We need to improve them and we need to expand and be there for, and give them more, more resources, uh, given that, that backing that they need. Uh, schools right now, you know, it's, it, it's a give and take situation really. When you look at all the bullying and everything that takes place within the schools, where is the accountability for the students? Where's the accountability that needs to take place? I can't tell you how many stories I've heard back and forth, um, including my own children who have been bullied. And so these are things that really need to get tackled. And when we bring them up to something, nothing gets answered. And that is something that I need answered. I, I want to get in there and actually have those resources available for uh, each student and the parents to be able to, to understand and correlate back and forth you know, with the board members. Um, it's essential to look at the accountability also for the mental health, the, the psychological health, as well as the well-being in the medical side. You know, there's a lot of different things that we don't understand that is going on. And human trafficking is, is a big thing here in Houston. And it's something that we really need to tackle. That's why emer expanded emergency preparedness and ready readiness training must be essential for parents, students, and staff alike. Thank you. Position six, Mr. Henry. It's a very important issue. Safety, I think, is one of the critical parts of, of a board member because we're folks I mean, it's, it's a, quite frankly, we can go to jail if we don't report this, these kind of information, especially around child trafficking, which as we know, Houston's the number two in child trafficking in, in America. It's a, huge, it's a huge problem right down 1960, if you're not aware of that. Uh, it's, it's a very sad part of our, of our history here in Houston. Uh, it's just also a very, uh, unfortunately, a, a bad part of our history too, because my family, when my son was in school, he actually experienced bullying. And uh, CyFair, unfortunately, does not do a great job of handling how we do in bullying. Um, and uh, I'm not going to have enough time to talk about that, but instead of dealing with the situation at hand, we actually we deal with the kid and we evacuate the room. We've got we to fix the policy and how we handle kids 
appropriately within within the school district. And I th think that policy has to be changed. But we have a big responsibility in that, and I think the LEAD program handles that in amount of time. But thank you. Thank you. Mr. Irving. Um, first, when it comes to school safety, um, like I mentioned before, I think it's extremely important to, number one, salute our officers for the good work that they do, but also to make sure that every child can come to school safe and be who they are without any fear from any child or retaliation in, in the form of bullying. But also, when it comes to the well-being of a, of a, of a good, of, for, a, for a student, uh, that also means closing the achievement gap that has been significantly increased during COVID. Um, some of, uh, a good portion of our school district has been virtual, and I think even before that, you know, it's extremely important that especially for uh, our children who are, less, uh, who are less privileged to be able to uh, sometimes go to school every day or participate in extracurricular activities and different things of that nature, that we continue to also strive and, and, and do everything that we can when it comes to a mental health, mental health standpoint. I actually stand by the district's uh, current uh, investment in, in mental health as well, and I also believe to ensure a good quality uh, equity education for all of our uh, for all of our students. Thank, Thank you. you, Mr. Ryan. During my uh, tenure on the board, uh, student safety, and and let's not forget employee safety. Uh, we want our employees to feel safe in the workplace as well, but it's it's been paramount. The students are our product, and Dr. Ogletree touched on a little bit. Uh, I was on the board uh, that had the vision to actually start our own police department in the district, and it's one of the best decisions we've ever made. If you talk to uh, campus leaders, principals, assistant, uh, assistant principals, they will tell you that having our own police department, they're, they're making, they have relationships with these students that we didn't have when we contracted out with the sheriff's department. Uh, so that was a great thing that we did. The other thing that we've done with our bond funds is we have increased security on every campus to where you can't just walk in the door, you have to be buzzed in. I think Courtney you know, touched on that a little bit. And then if you, if you ever get a chance to be a bus buddy, you'll see that our students check in every time with their ID tag and so we, we can keep count of them, make sure they're safe, even transported, transported to school and from, and from school. Sorry, I went over. No worries. Thank you. Mr. Harrison. Yes, when we talk about a, uh, safety, we talk about accountability. Uh, so reports have to be done out in those instances and uh, incidents, but performance reviews and audits have to take place. Um, without knowing what's happening, we can't uh, have improvement. So we have to understand what the root cause is, and that's when the parents get involved. In order to alleviate and stop the bullying and the assaults on teacher and vandalism, we have to get those parents involved. So it's not just a part of the board, but also the parents' involvement. So once we have that communication and that dialogue going to and from, then it brings that, those instances and, and those uh, uh, re reduction down. Thank you. Mr. Scanlon. Three points. One is at the school level, the second is at the classroom level, and then lastly at the uh, teacher level. So at the school level, our officers in the back, I applaud you, I was a teacher. And uh, in 2001, uh, on 9-11, I remember looking at our officers and being grateful that they were around and they were present. So it's important that our officers are available. Thank you very much for your service. At the classroom level, our students, too many times they own the classroom because they realize that the teacher has no real authority to enforce discipline. Why is that? It should not be that way. And so if we're trying to create a good classroom culture where our teachers want to be there, then there needs to be the ability to manage a disruptive child to a successful outcome. We don't know what they went through. We don't know what's going on at home, but it is our job to enable our teachers to deliver the curriculum, and if there's an interruption, to have the support from their principals and from their supporting staff to manage a child to a successful outcome. We need to do better there. Thank you. Mr. Covey. Well, I served on the board whenever we developed the board monitoring system, the system that uh, gives us the ability to take a look at the academic achievements that we have, our safety and security issues, our finance, uh, our recruitment and our retention. Uh, all of that is reported to this board on a regular basis 
and it is something that helps us in making decisions. The safety and security actually came about on the police force because uh, I believe it was Region 4 decided they were going to start charging us for their policemen. Uh, and so we decided to be better to go ahead and hire our own and have our own police force. So it's been an ongoing project, but I will let you know that it's highly important to the board and to the district to make sure we are safe and secure. My kids went into the open concept. The open concept is basically gone. There's a whole lot of changes, but it was an interesting concept at one time. We've outgrown it. Thank you. All right, our next question, we will move to position six. Mr. Irving, you will begin. How have you advocated for public education with our elected officials, especially in regards to funding? Well, that's all I've done since I've graduated. Um, I've continued, continuously advocated on behalf of public education, going to every single school board meeting. I've been at more meetings than anyone currently in my position, including the incumbent. Um, I also have advocated for uh, public education, more funding, especially working with the Sci-Fair Leadership Committee or CLC, um, in working with our state representatives and making sure that we have friendly edu education bills that are passed um, during our legislative sessions. Try to reduce the amount of funding that is going on in this state when it comes to public education. Trying to make sure that our school districts are equitably funded to be able to, um, to, be able to provide our students with the necessary materials that they need in the classroom. To give our teachers the best pay to be able to stay in the classroom so that we can continue to not only to retain but recruit highly well-educated educators that represent um, our constituency and our students. And I, like I said, I've been doing this since I've graduated high school and I will never stop no matter what the outcome of our election is. Thank you. Mr. Ryan. Yes, uh, I've had a really good relationship with our elected officials. Uh, the one thing that we've been able to do or that I've been able to do is, is reach across the aisle. We have some uh, Democratic representation, some Republican representation, uh, but the tag that they have is irrelevant to me. I'm, I want the funding that the district needs, and it's important that uh, as a board member you spend time to get to know your elected officials. I can tell you the ones that we've had uh, have been amazing when we had Patricia Harless. She was a, a big advocate for the district, and now Sam Harless is, and Representative Rosenthal. Uh, he's been a great advocate for the district as well. So having that relationship, and then also going to Austin, and then having the vision as a board member to actually start CLC, where we could bring in community members and say, hey, we need your help as well. It's not just the board, it's the entire community that needs to get behind the funding issues that we have in Austin. Mr. Harrison. Uh, currently, I have no uh, advocation for the, uh, with the elected officials, but this process has started, so thank you. Thank you. Mr. Henry. You, you know, understanding how schools are funded is a very complicated process, to be honest with you. It has changed over the years. I mean, um, just trying to understand how they're funded is, is, is a marvel in math itself. If you look at Common Core, I think you probably understand that myself. Um, <laughs> probably is more how you all get paid in, in schools. Um, quite frankly, I've not done the job that our school board members have done. Uh, I, I admire them, especially in the big fight they had, I think, was it four years ago, uh, when you're trying to get the money that they're due. Uh, I have talked to Paul Bittencourt. I have talked to, to Mr. Oliverson, who goes to Bible class with me, about the school funding. But I had not done the job they've done, just to be quite candid with you as well. Thank you. Mr. Kobe. <clears throat> well, I've had, the, uh, I've had the opportunity to advocate at the state level and visiting with a number of our representatives, senators, and legislators. Uh, being able to bring them back here into the school district, uh, offering some events where they could come in, actually see the teaching that was going on. Generally what we would see is a surprise look on their face and didn't realize everything that was happening, uh, especially in our extracurricular and our, our CE classes, which they didn't realize we had so many. But one of the things I've enjoyed doing is going to Washington, D.C., prior to the D.C. that happened back in January, but uh, going there and being able to talk to our senators and our representatives up there who are not as close to our district as 
They have been, but they love hearing about it. And finding a lot of our graduates up there working with these red, uh, legislators being, being their go-to people. And I, I truly, you almost feel like the government's being run by 24-year-olds. They're the ones running up and down the halls. Mr. Scanlon. So echoing one of the sentiments earlier, I've not had the opportunity to do the job what I, of the school board members and our trustees today. What I have done is I've exercised my vote. I've been an informed citizen, and I've worked in my community to understand the concerns and questions of our current educators and our past educators. So what I can say is that based on my experience, I understand very well how to negotiate, understand, to listen, and to be able to interact with state representatives whom are on both sides of the aisles to enable them to understand our vision and partner with our school district. Thank you. Mr. LeCompte? Please. Absolutely. How have you advocated for public education with our elected officials, especially in regards to funding? Uh, I have not advocated to any public official. This is, this is, this is the first time I've run for board. Uh, one, one thing I can tell you is this, if I were to be lucky enough to, to be chosen uh, by the voters, is that I have access to people that are a lot smarter than I am. And um, I, would, I wouldn't be afraid to ask for help and ask for the wisdom uh, that uh, those, those folks have gained from their experiences. Thank you. Ms. Bradley? Um, I neither have, I have not uh, advocated at the state legislature um, level. I have uh, had the opportunity to meet um, Representative Harless and Representative Oliverson, and we have begun a relationship. So that's already set. So if I do have the fortune of sitting on this board, um, I do know that I'll have the privilege of you know dealing with them and helping them as far as fighting for public education funding. Ms. Bossingame. I've had the opportunity to advocate with a group of principals in Austin around funding, um, meeting in offices with legislators up in Austin to make sure they understand the role and the challenges of public education. I've had an opportunity to advocate in D.C. around funding for after-school programming to extend time on tasks for students who are below level. Um, but I'll make a statement here about governance versus day-to-day -day operations. I do believe we, as the volunteer school board members, as a role of governance, should have some advocacy at the, with our legislators to make sure we represent the uh, needs of our school district. I think that should be informed by the administration, but uh, lobbying in the form of the people that are paid employees of the district is not a preferred practice. So we as the elected officials with the community, I think the CLC structure is clever. I think we could be more inclusive and expand that a bit for input, but I feel like we the community, we the citizens, we the elected officials should be those who will advocate. And it's not just for funding, it's for the programs to close the gaps of achievement to make sure every student achieves their full potential for programming. Ms. Horner. Open communication is what needs to be at the forefront with this. Um, being able to go down, <clears throat> excuse me, being able to go down to the, to the Senate and being able to, to advocate on different things, not on funding, but on being able to open that communication with the different legislatures, uh, legislative action within the local, the state, you know, the federal aspects of things. Uh, just having having the ability to understand what the community needs, what the parents are asking for, and what exactly is more pertinent to within the the district is is essential with all of, with all these things. Um, that being said, you know, when we look at at listening and reaching out to to the community and everything, um, you have to have the ability to speak to the board as well. And I've I've taken the opportunity to speak to the board members, the current board members, when we can, and just being able to have that that you know one-on-one -on -one communication is essential. Uh, we have to look at the the whole process as what is actually needed versus what is expending, uh, what is what is over overdone. And you know, just learning to understand exactly where we lay with all within the, the district as a whole and within the state. Thank you. Mr. Ogletree. Thank you. It is imperative that a board member be an advocate with our state legislators for funding and the other needs of public education. I have done that and since I've been on the board, during our legislative sessions, I make two to three trips to Austin uh, during our sessions. 
I have also spoken at uh, the American Federation of Teachers rallies, uh, rallies held uh, by other uh, pro-public uh, education uh, organizations. I've, I've spoken at those rallies on the Capitol grounds, as well as had Zooms and visits from our great state representative, John Rosenthal, who really has a heart for public education. Thank you. All right. Our next question, we will begin at position seven with uh, Mr. Scanlon. State law mandates character education. How do you believe the district should implement this mandate? That's an interesting question. Should an adult be required by the state to understand what is going through the mind of a child and coach them on how they feel about the problem? That's an interesting question, and as a parent, I find challenges with that. If we're thinking about character, the traditional sense of character means I've been given an opportunity, and I've risen to take advantage of that opportunity, and I've gone through the hard work necessary to accomplish the end goal, taking responsibility for my own actions. And so when we define what it means to teach character, I think really at the end of the day, that should only mean that a teacher is equipping a student with a framework for how to solve a problem, give them a challenging problem, and then coach them along the way while they accomplish that problem. It should not mean that an adult in a classroom is coaching a child on how they should feel, uh, who they are, their identity, in any scenario. Mr. Kobe. Well, as you stated, it is a law that is required of us. Uh, what I do feel is that technology today has allowed, uh, especially in social media, for people to post things that shows that they do not have character. Uh, and I'm a very concerned about that, especially uh, when I was talking with some of the technology teachers a couple of years ago before it really became rampant. They were very concerned about the citizenship that people were having on technology itself. So I don't have a problem with us having classes with character and education. What I do like is what our, our superintendent has said, and that is he's going to pull in his seniors that are his superintendent advisory councils. Uh, I think there's four or five from each high school. And they're going to talk about what is important to them. Then he's going to bring in the parents to look at what they've talked about and then share it with the community. This is what you've asked for. This is what we want to offer. And I think that's what we need to go with forward on the character and education. Thank you. Ms. Spradley. So obviously we have to teach character education because it's a law. Um, I am all for the committee, uh, having a committee together, because I think that's what we need in this district. I think we need to be listening to all stakeholders. I think it's great that we're listening to some high school students, but we want to back that up with, of course, uh, teachers, uh, parents, obviously, business owners, because ultimately they are going to be the recipient of the products that we give them when these children enter the work field. So I think they need to be involved in what some of those values are that they feel are important for character education as well. Um, I will back up what Mr. Scanlon said as far as it doesn't need to involve telling kids how to feel. It needs to be more along the lines of teaching respect, kindness, traits that a good person with character has. So um, I am all for having our own character education program that we the community have had uh, support in making. Ms. Blossom Game. Character ed, clearly to have productive citizens, their character is part of that. We're here first for academics, um, but definitely we do impact their minds. And therefore, I do uh, agree with the comment made that we need to not teach uh, aberrant theories and uh, things that take kids off that. Uh, however, we should create our own program. I think there should be a community uh, community input into the values that we determine are those which are uh, represent sci fair families. We should then, uh, and some of those could be, there are common values that are held across faiths, 
Um, and those are things like love, compassion, the golden rule, hope, integrity, respect, justice, charity, and humility. Um, those are things that uh, every faith can agree upon, but I think uh, that also goes along the idea of freedom of religion in schools. The fact is that people should be able to bring these values to their schooling, and they should be able to have discourse across differences um, around those things. So we have create our own curriculum based on what we, the community, feels, and we empower teachers to teach within those bounds. Ms. Horner. So it's interesting, last night at the board, I know that this is something that was brought up, and um, character education, it kind of goes in line with autonomy with teachers as well, because yes, it is, it is something that is mandated right now, um, but the level to which it is allowed to impose, the educators should not be imposing what they feel and you know, uh, imposing their own values and characters on, onto the students and must remain within the educational core values. Core values. And really, we need to get back to that core value, uh, the core education that has, that has seeped away from the, from the educational system as a whole. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's right in line with understanding that yes, there are certain things that should be taught, there are certain things that should continue to move forward as far as character goes, but it isn't an imposition over the children. That lays on the parent alone. Mr. Ogletree. If we only teach academics and do not attempt to shape the character of students, we have failed. It's important that we, as education, as educators, try to shape uh, good citizens, good citizens who respect and love and have compassion and appreciate the human dignity and worth of others and who are willing to fight for justice. Uh, being a good neighbor will always, always improve our community and make for good students. This is something we have to continue to strive for. Mr. LeCompte. I think the faculty should reinforce what the parents are should be teaching at home. That should be first and foremost. Uh, it's very simple. Don't, uh, I teach my kids, don't lie, don't cheat, don't steal, and obviously don't kill. Um, treat others with the, the way that you would want to be treated. It's a golden rule, very, very simple. Let's go back to, it goes back to my faith. Um, the other thing that I think is, is lost in this, in, that I've seen in, over the last few years with this country is the respect, the lack of respect for authority figures. And, the, and one of the things that, that, I think, I think a lot, of, a lot of issues that you've seen even on a national level, I think if we just respected authority figures a little bit more, I think, I, I really truly believe that things wouldn't escalate sometimes to, to the way that, to the, to the extent that they escalate. And I think again, that, that, that really, it, it's, it's on the faculty, but more, more importantly, it's on the parents at home doing their jobs. Thank you. Mr. Ryan. Yes, we, uh, we have amazing people on staff that write curriculum in our district. We can write our own curriculum for uh, character education. What we need to do when we do that, though, is, is, as others have said, is involve all of the stakeholders. That's parents, teachers, students. Uh, and then you also want to make sure that's critical is that as you do this, that all of your material is also age appropriate. Uh, there's, you, you can start at, a, at an elementary level and then build upon the, that program as you, as you go along. But we have the people on staff. Uh, we know the values this community has had for years and, and you focus on uh, what the community expects out of our character education program and then have our staff staff write the curriculum and then implement the curriculum. Thank you. Mr. Harrison. So character starts at home um, and the district supports or needs to reinforce that. Um, but again, we want children to be a contribution to society um, and we want them to feel good about themselves. We want them to know who they are. Um, the anxieties and the mental health and issues that children face um, we want them to be able to withstand 
and endure and be able to go out into the world when it's unfair. But understand that just because it's unfair, it doesn't make me ugly to the next person sitting next to me. It makes me stronger, but it doesn't make me bitter. And that's what part of the character that we need to instill in the district and make sure that we are reinforcing that on a district level and a parental level. Thank you. Mr. Mr. Henry? You know, it's very sad we have to teach character. When I grew up, we had that, you know? And if we didn't have that, my butt got beat, you know? Um, if we are gonna have to teach it because state law says that, I wanna see it first as a parent, what it is. And I wanna check off on that, I'm sorry. Uh, because I want to respect the parent boundaries that I have as a parent. Uh, that's first and foremost. And quite frankly, uh, I want to be able to opt out of that if I can, if I don't really like that what I see. There's a lot of great books out there. Stephen Covey has a fantastic book on, on, on those values out there we can look at. But there's even great, there's a better one that I call the Bible. Uh, look, let's, let's look at that. Um, there's a very good verse called, Love Thy Neighbor as Thyself. If we just focus on that one verse, if we love other people as we love ourselves, if we just start there. That's what teachers do every day. They love the kid as themselves. That's how they teach. That would start the world a better place every single day. Mr. Irving. So there's a difference between implementing good character in our kids, but also making sure that our educators are not parenting our kids. Um, I actually want to echo what Natalie had said. I think it's extremely important that we do this by creating a committee, having all stakeholders included, parents, teachers, staff, uh, bo the board, different people in the administration, all come together and really define what exactly does that mean? Implementing respect, good decency, strong, strong minds, good work ethic, being humble, and also good patriotism. I think that's extremely important as well. Um, making sure that our kids are voting. We don't implement, I do like how we are starting to have our kids vote as seniors, but that needs to be taught earlier. Having our kids go into the military, go into our police force, go and serve as firefighters. You know, it's just not necessarily about right from wrong, but also how to conduct yourself as a citizen, I think is extremely important as well. And we can do that if we all come together. Thank you. All right, candidates, it's our final question. All right, we will start with uh, position five, um, and uh, Ms. Blossom Game will be our first. How will you balance differing opinions when dealing with controversial issues? Ms. Blossom Game. That's, uh, I've had a lot of practice doing that. I've run schools um, as a principal for many years, and that is uh, part of the job, is to listen to all sides of an issue, um, have the compassion. We've talked today about parents have the right to make decisions for their own child, and so the first thing is to make sure that um, the opinions of the parent for their child are put first. The bureaucracy, the system, the board, the administration is not the authority and the first decision maker for a parent. So to the point of voice, choice, and values, the voice of the parent is executed for them to talk about the choices they want that match their values for their child. So that will be the, uh, when it's a controversial uh, uh, issue, the parent's voice will trump all. Ms. Horner. So as a psychologist, obviously one of the things that I have to learn and I've uh, mastered is the ability to reach out and listen to others. Listening is so imperative. You know, a lot of times as human beings, what we do is we listen to answer instead of to listen to understand. Understanding what is taking place within the other side is imperative. You know, our children are the ones that are at risk here. Yeah, our children are the ones that are on the line. And it's not about deferring here, deferring opinions here and the other. Yeah, you can understand, you can uh, listen to the other side, whatever the, the questions are, but have the compassion to understand what is going on and beneath the surface. Now, that being said, you cannot impose you know, your character upon others. And kind of in line with what we were talking about before with character, um, it takes more than just teaching. It's exhuming. It, it's actually 
putting your character out there and showing them what it is based on who you are, based on what you're doing, and based on your values. And yes, it is imperative to be able to reach out to, the t to parents and the, the board and the schools alike, be able to have that connection. Thank you. Mr. Ogletree. Uh, this is what I've done all my life, and that is to work in a cohesive manner. I've listened, dialogued, and had a thought about the discussion and then made a, a, a sound decision. As board members, we come from all different backgrounds, and what we have to do is value each other and try to make sure that we work civilly as well as cohesively with each other, as well as with the superintendent. We are models for our students, and our students are watching us whenever we act in an uncivil manner. So we have to raise that bar and work cohesively and respect each other. Mr. LeCompte. I just think that dialogue is super important. I think that uh, having an actual conversation with you know, a person that has a deferring a viewpoint, keeping things civil, not getting heated, uh, not getting to the point where, we, where we're shouting over each other. Um, and, and, just, and again, it goes back to basically treating every, everyone with, with respect. And I think sometimes it's difficult for, for people if they, if they have such a a uh, strong opinion on something, it's very difficult for people to be convinced otherwise. So sometimes the best, the, the best thing to do is just agree to disagree, and I think we need to get back to that, is, is, is sometimes just agree to disagree. We're, gonna have, we're, gonna, we're not always going to get along with everybody. We're not always going to share the same opinion. But uh, just to have dialogue and, um, and to be able to conversate and treat each other as human beings first, I think that is, uh, is, 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 is just important moving forward. Ms. Bradley. All right. Well, apparently I'm good at uh, listening and um, uh, listening to other people's opinions. I've been happily married for 15 years, so I still have my husband waiting for me at home. So, uh, <laughs> so uh, I think the important thing to do is listen to understand. And as it's already been mentioned, you know, realize that people come from different. Uh, different places, they have different values, they have different opinions, um, different ideologies even, and just making sure that you are listening to understand and um, at the forefront of all of our decisions as a board member, it's what's best for the child. And so making sure you're keeping that at a forefront. So, Mr. Harrison? So listening and having constructive dialogue is always healthy. Um, Again, everybody's different. Uh, we no long, nobody comes from the same background. Uh, and understanding that uh, our deepest thoughts that force difference of opinion forces us to break the monotony. Uh, myself being up here, sitting next to a gentleman that's been here for 20 years on the board, is that correct? Yes. And understanding that he has, has done some great things, but part of the next phase is going to be new ideas, new perspective. And that's not a bad thing. Uh, part of going back to the character strong is understanding that we're building new ideas, but on the foundation that's already been built. So we can have a difference of opinion, but we can agree where there's agreements, and we can have agree to disagree when we need to. Thank you. Mr. Henry. I don't know if you've ever worked on an HOA board for eight years like I have. No one ever agrees on that. And I worked on that for eight years. And I actually did that for eight years and actually kept the dues at eight for eight years the same amount of money. Also being on a deacon for a long time. Being on a church board with lots of committees, you never make anyone happy there either. I also run a multi-million dollar business with 300 people and across the world I do matrix management, especially when dealing with people all across the world and especially when I deal with people in Tokyo, Japan, who don't even speak your own language and trying to get them to agree to you. It's hard. But at the end of the day, we're dealing with kids. 
It's for the kids. It's for the kids. Kids first. We have to create win-win situations for the kids. And if you create a situation that's for the kids, for their situation, we're doing it for the right reasons, and everyone has the same purpose in mind. We can make it work. Mr. Irving, can you please repeat the question? How will you balance differing opinions when dealing with controversial issues? Okay. So let me answer the question. Um, what I plan to do is, and to implement with my other fellow trustee board members if I'm blessed enough to get elected, is I want to take parents, stakeholders, state representatives, students, and teachers, and I want to have a town hall once a month. I think it's important that we, if we actually are about equity and inclusion, inclusion of all, not everyone can afford to go to school board meetings. The parent, the single mother that has three children at home can afford to have her voice heard. The, the individual who is a police officer who works late night hours can afford to have his voice heard to, miss, to, 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 to go to school board meetings and miss out on work. I think it's important that we try to create a process that we get everyone's voice included. I think a town hall would be actually fantastic because it allows more individuals in our community who can't afford to go to school board meetings to be able on a weekend to be able to come together, bounce ideas off of each other, and actually balance what is important so that we can move forward as a community together. Mr. Ryan? Well, I'm, I'm sure this won't shock any of you out in the audience, but I've had a little experience dealing with this lately uh, in my role as a, as a board member. Uh, but I think what's, there's nothing wrong, and I think Chris touched on a little bit, there's nothing wrong with different opinions. Some of the best programs and ideas that we've had in the district have been bounced around because people had different opinions. Uh, I think what is wrong is, is not respecting the person that has the different opinion. Uh, I think that's, I, I don't think that's a, uh, I just don't think it's a very Christian thing to do, and, I, and other people have talked about it up here. You treat others the way you want to be treated. Uh, you don't necessarily have to give someone respect uh, if they have a completely different opinion than you, but you can listen and try to understand where they're coming from and still stay strong with your own personal beliefs and values. Mr. Kobe. You know, actually, we have lived through a dysfunctional board a number of years ago, and it was not a happy time. Uh, and it was a, a situation where there was disrespect, and there was people that were serving that had a one agenda item, and that's what they strive to do. And we agreed as a board that we needed to be setting ourselves a little bit higher than that because we felt like that our students, and this is who it's for, it is for the students, our students were looking at us and they were emulating who we were and what we were doing. We were their models. I have always believed that there's three sides to every story. There's a left, there's a right, and somewhere in between you'll find a commonality, and that's what I tried try to do. So when I'm dealing with situations that are difficult, I try to remember that and I try to uh, listen. As my dad would say, you only got one mouth and you have two ears. So listening is twice as good. Thank you. Mr. Scanlon. Thank you. People have to be heard. There has to be a feedback mechanism that is relevant to the community. There has to be a way for the stakeholders of our community, our parents, our teachers, staff members, uh, and taxpayers to come together and be able to understand what is being presented, the policies that we're recommending, and absorb that feedback in a meaningful way. I deal with change all the time. I lead change for Fortune 500, Fortune 100, Fortune 100 companies, and what I all the time see is that we have to be able to incorporate key opinions and then through healthy dialogue attain a reasonable answer. Our children have very diverse needs. We have children who are coming from very uh, prosperous homes and we have children that are in non-prosperous homes. Their needs are vastly different and we've got to be very nimble to be able to meet the needs of all of those kids we must be able to form those committees and understand those special interests to be able to incorporate all that feedback successfully. Thank you.
All right. At this time, each candidate will have one minute to provide a closing statement, and we will go in reverse order from how we started, starting with position seven, Mr. Scanlon. Thank you very much. Thank you as a community for coming out tonight and listening to us and those that are going to view online. We appreciate you, and this board is elected by the community and should represent the community, period. My goal for my run and what I hope to do for us is to be able to properly represent all the views and all the opinions. It's not, when elected, it's not my seat, it's a seat in which I serve. And it's a process I put in place to listen to the community members and actually establish those feedback loops and mechanisms so that we can all raise our children. It is for our kids. We have to be able to find common ground and serve the needs of our kids so they're competitive today and tomorrow. So I appreciate everyone's support. I appreciate the vibrancy of our community. Thank you. Mr. Kobe. Well, as everyone knows, I've served on this board for 16 years, and I'm very proud of the things that we've accomplished in those 16 years. The homeowner tax rate decrease, the preserved optional homestead exemption, even though we were fought by the legislature, our increase in teacher pay from 45 to 58,000 over a 10 year period of time, ERG ranking us number one, two, three, and four for our financial effectiveness and efficiency. Uh, so many things that we've done. This board was the 2015 Board of the Year by, is chosen by the Texas Association of School Administrators. In my time on this board, I have seen this group grow from 79,000 students to 116,005. One of the things that's the biggest deal is we've grown from 28% economically disadvantaged to 57% economically disadvantaged. If you want to change just for change, go ahead and do that. But if you want somebody that's going to take this further and what we've done to it to bring it to this point, I would be your choice. Thank you. Mr. Henry. A little over 24 hours ago, I was in the hospital with my daughter. And I didn't know if I was going to be here because she was fighting for her life. And she told me that she didn't know if she was going to leave the hospital, but she did, thankfully, and prayerfully she'll be okay. That's the reason why I'm running. That's the reason why I think all of us who are up here is for the kids. We are fighting for the kids because we want a better education for their, for their life. We want a better tomorrow for them. We want them to do what is the very best for them. We want a better transparency of this board. We want a better accountability of this board. We want term limits for this board. We want them not to be up here forever. We want them to be accountable to the public. We want them to be answerable to the public. We want them to be available to the public, not just the two minutes they give us at the board meetings. They have done a great job for us, and they've served us very well, and we admire from what they've done, and we appreciate what they've done. We have the best teachers in the world. We want to give them the best support they can. I hope you'll vote for me, and thank you very much. Mr. Harrison. Again, my reason for, for being here is for the students. Um, my 11-year-old and my 2-year-old, starting with them, but again, district-wide. I want our students to be able to compete, not just on local level, not on a state level, but a global level. Um, background in sciences, so not too many for words, but we want to be able to comp compete, and we'll continue to do that, but we need to shake up things a little bit. And if my role up here is just to get that started, then I've done my job. Mr. Ryan. I want to thank everyone for attending tonight, and Jason, thank you for hosting and for Community Impact. Uh, I've told you this every year. You all are such an asset to the community, and we so appreciate you, so thank you for that. Uh, I've never looked at myself as a politician, even though we're seeking a, a political office. I've looked at myself as a volunteer. That's, that's what I've done during my tenure on the board as I volunteer. My personal philosophy is that Politicians get paid, and volunteers get results. During my tenure on the board, I've gotten results. I would appreciate your continued support. I still have a passion for serving, and I want to continue to serve. Whether or not 
win or lose this election, I'm still going to be a global volunteer in CyFair because I believe in our district, I believe in our community, I believe in our employees and our students, and I look forward to your support in the upcoming election. Thank you very much. Mr. Irving. Um, I first want to start out by thanking all the stakeholders in our community for either tuning in at home or coming here and watching and being in tune with what's going on with your child's education. Um, I want to build on progress already made. I think it's time to turn the page. I don't think anyone should be in office for a quarter of a century. I think it's important that if we want to continue our success, we have got to evolve. To evolve, we need change. I'm not talking about going backwards. I'm talking about moving forward. Our community doesn't care about red or blue. They don't care about what faith you are. All they care about, and this is how I know this because I've been in the classroom with some of your children, all they care about is making sure that they have a good, equi equi equitable, quality education for their children and that their children have the same opportunity that every other child has at a quality education. This November election is pivotal. We have a chance to move forward and to evolve and to grow together. But we also have an opportunity and a chance to move backward. My name is Ryan C. Irving Jr. and I hope to have your support on this November 2nd election. Thank you and may God. Mr. LeCompte. I'd like to talk about transparency of curriculum and lesson plans. MIT puts all of their information online for everyone to see. I think if we start doing something like that, I think we can end divisive curriculum that's being pushed to indoctrinate our children and push political agendas. I believe that a three-term limit is quite enough. Thank you very much. You, raised a, you helped raise a generation of children. That doesn't mean that you still can't serve the community. It just means you get another person gets an opportunity to serve. Um, I, bring, I bring a logical, common-sense approach to decision-making. Okay? I'm a business owner. If it doesn't make dollars, it doesn't make sense. That's, that's, what, I, that's what I like to talk about. Uh, I can think of a thousand reasons why term limits are beneficial. I can't think of many reasons why we shouldn't, all right? Um, the direction this country is headed in because of lack of term limits, it's the reason why we're in the condition we're in right now. I appreciate everybody uh, that was watching at home, the people that are in the audience, thank you very much. My name is Todd LeCompte, and I, I hope I've earned your support November 2nd. Thank you. Mr. Ogletree. Thanks again for coming and for viewing tonight. I'm Dr. John Ogletree, and I believe my experience and training are an asset to this district. My leadership and advocacy for public education is proven. I want to continue to work as a consensus builder, working civilly and cohesively with my fellow board members, the superintendent, and with the citizens of this community. I believe that we need to move forward and not backwards. And we're at a crossroads where we have to avoid partisan, partisan politics. I've been endorsed by the largest teacher union that represents teachers, counselors, bus drivers, uh, uh, custodians, uh, food service workers, and I value our teachers and want to continue working for them. I'm John Ogletree, position five, number four on the ballot, your opportunity for all candidates. Thank you. Ms. Warner. You know, as a marriage and family therapist, I have very intimate knowledge as to what is hurting our families the most in this district. It's unbelievable the things that have, that have taken place, but I've also had the joys of walking with my families and my patients, and it's absolutely outstanding to see their growth within the district as well. You know, I am the American dream, and I've sworn an oath to this nation three different times. One, as a, as a naturalized citizen. Secondly, as a medical provider. And third, as a US Navy sailor. I took that oath seriously, and I expect to take that oath within the service that I will be providing for your families and your children. 
That being said, I face every challenge head on. I am not afraid to answer the call and I'm not afraid to take on all the different critiques and challenges that come, come by way. We know that being a board member can be exhausting. We know that uh, we understand all the different challenges that might come in place. My passion is in helping children and families achieve that success, and I specifically work with at-risk children and with abused children. That's why my platform is very specifically summarized into something I call Grace's Aces. American values, checks and balances, enrichment of excellence, safety and security. I'm Dr. Grace Horner for position five. Please vote for me on November 2nd. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Ms. Blossengame. Um, Dr. Natalie Blassengame, I want to represent you on this board in position five. I'm number two on the ballot. We have 52,000 students in our district who are Hispanic or 45%. Will you indulge me a moment to address them in Spanish, their families? A los padres y familias latinas, Quiero representar su voz, sus opciones y sus valores en nuestra junta directiva para averiguar que sus hijos tengan un futuro exitoso. And now to translate, I want to represent the voice, the choice, and the values of all the students in our district to make sure that every student has an option of a brilliant future. I would appreciate your support. Natalie Blassengame, position two, voice, choice, and values. Thank you. Ms. Bradley. Hello, thank you again for uh, tuning in or being in the audience. Uh, just want you to know I will be an advocate for teachers, staff, and students. As a mom, I also know how important the school day is. Our kids spend eight hours a day at school. Us as parents, we trust the teachers and the district to teach our kids and to take care of them and keep them safe. As a public school board member, I will make sure we value all of the varied beliefs in school and have and have to be extremely careful and purposeful not to divide our students based on religion, race, gender, or any other factor. We are here to serve all kids and make sure all kids get a quality education. We need to protect our students, make school a safe place to be where they can grow, learn, and become productive citizens. As we so proudly state in SciFair, we learn, our students learn, empower, achieve, and dream. Courtney Spradley, position five, number one on the ballot. Thank you. Candidates and incumbents on behalf of Cypress Fairbanks ISD and the residents within this community, thank you so much for your willingness to step forward and volunteer for a position on the board. The election, as a reminder, will be held jointly with this year's general election. Election day is Tuesday, November 2nd, and the polls will be open from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. Early voting takes place from October 18th to October 29th. The most up-to-date information on early voting and election day times and locations may be obtained by visiting harrisvotes.com. For those in attendance this evening, please remind your friends and neighbors about the importance of casting their vote. I wish each of you best of luck in the remainder of your campaign. Have a safe trip and a great night. Thank you.